All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for spending your morning with us here on day two of the fall University express semester. I recognize all of you, but as you know, I'm Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of the program and I work for the Department of Senior Services here in Erie County. Most of you know, Jim Banco, who we're here virtually with today. Um, before we jump to his presentation, just quickly, because WebEx has made a couple updates um, to make it a little more user friendly, but. We'll be using the Q and a panel to talk today or to communicate together. So that probably popped up on the screen for you when you joined. If not, if you wiggle your mouse or touch or poke your screen, it should pop up in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. It'll be a square with a question mark in it and says Q and a. So that's likely where you'll be able to find that. I would like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is my department of senior services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Celsius Orthopedics and Wegmans because they help make the program possible. And don't hesitate to give us a call at Senior Services. If you or a loved one needs any help or wants to know what they qualify for, we're at 858-8526. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Jim. Jim Banco taught English for almost 30 years in the city of Buffalo. He taught every level from eighth grade to AP English. He also taught SAT prep classes at Buffalo State College. As the oldest of eight children, as we just heard, college money was not available, to, so Jim spent 14 years going to night school to get his degrees. He was a journeyman iron worker who worked on the many of the major buildings in Buffalo. He fondly remembers walking up the 33 flights of stairs at the now vacant HSBC building. Coming back though. But this foundation was the basis of his teaching career. He learned what men do to support their families and the struggles that we all go through in living a life. Jim sums up his philosophy simply with a quote from Tom Shulman. We don't read and write literature because it's cute. We read and write literature, poetry, novels, essays, because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. Medicine, law, business, engineering are all noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But beauty, love, romance, these are what we stay alive for. Jim saw these lessons every day on the job and tried to convey the importance of knowledge to his students. Jim, teach us about poetry, please. Here we go. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you've all uh, been on the website and you've got uh, contact or you've got access to the poems we're going to talk about. Poetry defies definition. I have tried many times to come up with a simple definition of poetry and it never works. Uh, you know what it is when you see it and you'll know what it is when you hear it. Let me offer a definition of poetry that I have found. Poetry is metrical writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience and language chosen and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhythm. Wow. Is that what you think about every when you're reading a poem? That poem, poetry is a mythical writing that formulates a concentration. That is so involved that it, it, it's, it's beyond understanding of where somebody came up with that definition. Now, if we go on further, Voltaire said poetry is the music of the soul. Now, isn't that better? Isn't, isn't that better how he encapsulates just what a great poem is? Poetry is the music of the soul. I like that better. Robert Frost, who I, who I love as a poet, poetry is when emotion has found a thought and the thought has found words. Now, now, if you try to compare those two definitions, that first one I read about poetry is a metrical writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience, yada, yada, yada. I mean, on and on. Which definition would you, would you, whether, would you want to go with? Would you want to assign your poem to? I love the poetry is when emotion has found a thought and a thought has found words. The simplicity of that definition def defines definition. That's what it is. 
I often compare poetry, trying to make an analogy, trying to make it clear to my students. Let's compare a motion picture to a snapshot. A motion picture is a two hour, two hour long reel of, of fleeting images and dialogue flashing up upon a screen. Now you sit over there and you and you are mesmerized by what's going on, but there are scenes that are stopped that you remember. Uh, you've all seen Casablanca, I hope. You know when Humphrey Bogart is on the tarmac with uh, with Bergman. That's what you remember, not the whole build up and everything, but you freeze that moment. Doctor Shivago, when. Uh, Chivago, Lawrence, or uh, Omar Sharif is frozen. And he finally makes his way through the snow and everything. And he, he's trying to find his Lara. And the camera just freezes his face. That's what you'll remember. That split moment in time. That's the image. Not the whole movie. Not the whole two hours worth or two and a half, whatever it is. So we go on back comparing poetry as a film to a snapshot. Poetry is a snapshot. Poetry is that moment of life that is frozen, that the image is frozen forever. And now we, like any image that's frozen, we stand there and we're able to look at it and be able to try to understand what the poet is trying to say. I often liken this to the Mona Lisa. That's a painting. That's all it is. It's a painting. It's a painting of a woman. That's all. So why do people flock to the to the Louvre in Paris and stand in front of this Mona Lisa and stand there for hours? They're trying to understand who is she? Where is she? What is she looking at? Where? How did he paint her? Who? Where did she come from? Why her and not somebody else? What makes this masterpiece a masterpiece? Why are we drawn to the Mona Lisa? There's something about this, this frozen moment in time. That's just a woman who was sitting on a posing for Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, excuse me, and he painted her. So now we're drawn to go over there and watch and we go out and where we create our own ideas of who she is. Where is she looking? Watch her eyes. Look at her hands. Someone posed their hands that way. That's why we stand over there and we watch her. And we try to understand what Mike Leonardo da Vinci, excuse me, Leonardo da Vinci was trying to say. He's trying to make He's trying to say something in his in his uh, portrait of this of this lady, and we are mesmerized by what uh, what she is doing, what she is saying, and what it's saying to us. That's poetry. Have you ever been to uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City? Uh, there are times they have a statue in there, the Pietà. And people got drawn. The Pieta is a statue of Mary holding Christ after he has been taken down from the cross. And people, you stand in front of this. All it is is a, it's a marble stat, a statue. Someone, Michelangelo, took a hammer and chisel and carved the Pieta out of a piece of marble. So why are we drawn to that? You're over there looking at a mother holding her dead son. The expression of sorrow on her face is so painful and so and, and so meaningful that we too are brought into her own sorrow. And, her, and the way he posed the Christ figure hanging in her arms. This is her son. And again, that's poetry. One little chunk of marble that someone took and carved and chopped and did all of these little things, however, however you're able to do that, 
That's what Michelangelo was Michelangelo. He created this masterpiece and we stand in front of, we're trying to understand how did he pose this? Did someone, did someone fill in for somebody? Did he actually have figures? Or did he just do this from his memory? Where did he get the face? Look at, if you ever see the Pieta, go online and you can get pictures of it. Look at the face that he carved of Mary. The pain, the sorrow, the anguish in her face. It really is dramatic. This is her son who's just been crucified and is taken down from the cross that he's holding. And it's really just a, a big chunk of marble that somebody has carved this image into. Again, that's poetry. Poetry is what gives us meaning. And like Robert Frost said, is when emotion has found thought and thought has found words. What words can you ascribe to the Pieta or the Mona Lisa? Uh, we walk away astounded, uh, amazed by what we've by, by what we've seen, and we go back and back, and we study it, and we look at it, and that's what makes great works of art, and that's why we read great poems over and over again. Right now, when we go on out there and look at it, and look, what I was going to do is just give you some examples of uh, poetry of great, what I consider great poetry. You might not like what I like, but uh, you know, you find your own, right? It might be inside of a Christmas card for all I know. But as long these words, if we put them all together, they become something like Voltaire said, it becomes music for the soul. Let me just read a poem by Robert Frost. Stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake, to ask if there was some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Now, that's only 16 lines that to me are so profound in their depth of thought. I've read this poem uh, 200 times at least. And every time I go on back and I try to really understand what Frost is over here trying to say. If you want to, when you're doing a poem like this, the first thing I'd like you to do is try to paraphrase it try to rewrite this as prose, you know, like say, what's going on over here? You know, you got a guy on a horse, he's going through, a, he's going through some woods that he shouldn't be there. He knows he shouldn't be there. He, he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. He's trespassing. He shouldn't be in those woods. And then his horse, even knows that. He gives his hands, what are you doing here? What are we doing? Is there something going on over here? It's the darkest evening of the year. So I'm over here assuming it's December the 21st, which is the winter solstice, which is the darkest evening of the year. After December 21st, we start getting uh, a few more minutes of light. I mean, but that is the darkest, darkest evening of the year. So there you get this image of this man on a horse in a woods that he trespassing in. And even his horse doesn't know why he's there. His harness, his horse is smarter than the man. What are we doing? Let's go home. It's cold. I mean, those are the kind of things that you, that should come to your head as you read this. That's what poetry really forces you to do is to ask questions. Why? 
Why is he there? What is he doing? What's going on over? There? And then you take those questions and then you embody them in your own in your own personhood, in your own self, and you apply them to yourself. He gives his heart as spells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. So that's the other thing now we know. That it is terribly quiet. It is one of those cold, frigid, dark December nights. And the only other sound is just that of the wind as it goes through the woods. Kind of eerie. And then he ends. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. Yes, they are. There's something magical. There's something mystical about these woods that he are in. Now, again, it forces you to think about some woods, some snowy, some winter day, some night that you were out and you look at the trees filled with snow and say, man, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that? There's something... Winter is much different than summer. You know, there's a, there's a different appearance. There's a different magic. And then he finishes off. I have miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. He has a mission. Right? This far, this guy on the horse, and that's how we that's all we know about him. He's on a mission. He's got things he's got to do. And he hasn't got time to stand there and ponder and wonder and write a poem about the woods. He's got promises to keep. He's got obligations. He's got things he's got to do. Like we all do in our lives. We have we've, uh, promises. We've, we've got obligations. We've got people that we that we that we love people that we care about things that we need to do and certainly at the miles to go before i sleep and miles to go before i sleep those two lines have been interpreted a thousand times about robert frost's death wish and when he's asked and robert frost was a character when he's asked he just says no is that about dying and death? He says, no. Well, what's it about? He says, what do you think it's about? That's the secret. What do you think it's about? If you want to think it's about death and dying, then you go right ahead. But if you want to think it's about something else that he's got, to, he's got miles to go before he needs to rest in his, in his time and his, thing, in his journey, his work effort is done. Not that he's going to die. But we all have to take a vacation. We all have to take our rest. Right? You think about it. That's what Frost was over your time. He said, what do you think this poem means? And he come right back and say, what do you think it means? He said, I don't know what it means. He said, it's, I wrote it. It took him 20 minutes to write this. Can you imagine being able to write something like this for 10, 20 minutes? Not me. I, I couldn't do it. Right? But there's so much because he knows very well that inside of this is his heart and soul. And that's what makes him a poet. When I asked him what, a, uh, what is poetry, Robert Frost said, that's the stuff poets write. How's that for a definition? You just want to make it simple? What's poetry? That's the stuff that poets write. Okay, Robert. Huh? I mean, that's, that's the uniqueness about, about poetry. It becomes individualized. I mean, you are the ones who determine what, you, what this means, right? You think about what this means. I mean, stopping by the woods, it means a bunch of different things to different people. You see the picture of my beautiful wife over my shoulder over here. She, I wanted to make sure everybody sees uh, that's uh, I got 50 years invested with this woman. So there's a poem right there. So I hope that's making a little bit clear. Here's another one. Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Now, as I read these poems, I want you to think about these definitions that we went through. 
poetry being the music of the soul, Robert Frost about emotions capturing thoughts, and this other, the first definition I gave you about uh, metrical writing, emotional response, and uh, you know, that's, think about that definition, Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond the place of wrath and tears looms the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, if you can read that without thinking or pausing in your own life, right? especially those last lines, I am the captain of my soul then, you know, you have to have, you have, you need to take up some sensitivity training. This poem should move you, attack you, and again, poetry has to be read again and again and again, right? There's a despair out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. There's a sense of despair, right? Things are, things aren't going well for Henley the poet. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. No matter what's going on in his life, he's standing up and he's thanking God for this unconquerable soul. He's standing up and saying, thank you. No matter what adversity I'm being faced with, I'm gonna handle this. In the foul clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. He hasn't complained. He hasn't said anything. He hasn't griped about what's going on. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody, but I'm bowed. He's taken a beating. He's taken some shots. But is he done? No. And that's the key. If you want to, if I, if we were in a classroom, I'd have you paraphrase this and say, what is he saying? Write this out in a paragraph, not poetic, in a paragraph about what he's saying. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. He's talking about our final days, right? The things that are, the, you know, something bad's going to happen. The horror of the shade. And yet that menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. This courage. He's facing life with undoubted courage of strength. And that offers us inspiration for our own lives if we stop and are willing to think about it. Isn't that, that's, that's the key. That you just not, you know, you, you know, like the students used to say, well, well we got to read this. Of course you have to read it, but you have to try to read it and you understand there's reading, that's recitation of the words and then understanding what those words are saying. Do you think William Ernest Henley wrote this just to upset you? I used to say that a lot to my students. You think he wrote this just so I wait till some high school kids read this. They'll be upset with this one. No, he wrote this from his own heart. He's trying to explain. It's the same way when Michelangelo sculpted the Pieta. Did he just do that so it would have a place in St. Patrick's Cathedral? No. No. There's an image he wanted to portray. There's something that he wanted to say. There's something that he wanted to move us and touch us with that look of Mary, with the look of Christ in her arms, her dead son. And he finishes off, Henley finishes off, it matters not how straight the gate, it matters not, you know, how, how, how life, how straight, you know, life is gonna take us. We all face adversities. We all face things, obstacles that are going to, you know, hinder us in some way. 
how charged with punishment the scroll you know the, the the things we you know we we wonder why did god do this to me why why did this happen to me we are faced with some sometimes uh, there are people in our lives and even ourselves who get you know are, uh, bad things happen and that's all there's even a book that somebody wrote once so why do bad things happen to good people i don't know i don't know but i do know I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, again, you take those lines and now you have to go on up there and say, what does that mean? I'm the master, no matter how difficult this life is, no matter how bad things are going to be, you are in charge of you. You are the one that is in control of your own life. You are in control of your own destiny. I, I think that uh, in, again, 16 lines. That's all it is, 16 lines. This isn't a 275 page novel, but he says as much in those 16 lines as many 275 page novels do about courage, about uh, triumph, about standing up to uh, fate. Am I making any sense? No, no questions yet, Katie? No questions yet. I think everyone's oh. just absorbing, Jim. You're great. Oh, just absorbing, huh? All right. Like I said, this woman behind me on that wall, uh, we've been married 50 years. Well, anybody could stand 50 years with me. Yeah. God, but God bless her. Now we're going to talk over here about Shakespeare. And again, Shakespeare, says, oh, no, listen. It's all you have to do is listen to what he says. And that makes a difference. When I'm teaching Shakespeare, the first thing I try to do is I introduce his sonnets, which again are short. They're 14 lines. That's all. 14 lines. This is one you should all recite to your wives, to your husbands. Let me not to the marriage of true minds amid impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no. It is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass comes. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be an error and upon me proved, I never wrote, nor no man ever loved. Now, that to me is an amazing piece of work written 500 years ago about really, about what love really means. Let me not to the marriage of true minds amid impediments. Let me again paraphrase this. Don't let anything, you know, come in the way of true love. The little obstacles that we face, I mean, anybody that's been married, have my wife and I have ever had a, a fight? Oh, we've, we've argued and complained and everything, you know, in 50 years, certainly. But we overcome those and we've, we rise to the occasion. And that's what I tell people very simply. I still love this woman. Even after all, after all those years, love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. If it, if, if every time there's a little quiver or something in your, in your life, when you're love, then it's really not love. You have to be able to stand up to the storm or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark. It is there. It is an ever fixed. It is, it is there. You just can't say no. I look at Jimmy Carter just had his 96th birthday. 
Jimmy Carter and Rosalind have been married for 75 years. Isn't that extraordinary? 75 years, you have woken up next to this woman, you've had breakfast with her, you've talked with her, you've laughed, you've cried. I mean, 75 years is extraordinary. And I, I used to have students uh, who still get a hold of me. They've been, they've been out of high school 10, 10 years and they've been married three times. You know, and their answer to me was, I said, what are you doing? What's, 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 what's going on? And then he says, well, I want to be happy. Happy? What to define happy? You know, what, what is happy? Winning the lottery? Uh, you know, I mean, what is happy? I mean, how do you think Jimmy Carter stays married for 75 years? And I know some other people that have been married for 60, 50, 50, right here, right? Happy is a state of mind. It's, it's how, you, how you approach things. It isn't Christmas every day. It isn't, right? It is the star to every wandering bark. You know, it's going to get you through. Love is going to get you through life. Whose words unknown, though his height be taken, love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's cup has come. They've been married 75 years. Rosalind and Jimmy Carter knew each other when they were 21. He has just celebrated his 96th birthday. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They still hold hands. They're still, they're still in love. They love each other. They appreciate each other. After all, so age and time, that's what Shakespeare was saying, has no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks. It doesn't change if it's true, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Like the priest minister says, right? Right, you you take your vows, right, to do or die, right, till death be it do us part. Well, that's what it is, till death do us part. And in this be an error upon me proved I never wrote nor no man ever loved. If I'm wrong, and I love that at the end of his uh, of his sonnet, and they're all fourteen lines. So look at the power that you can accumulate in 14 lines. And like Voltaire said, he said, oh, poetry is the music of the soul. If this isn't music to your own soul, then I'm not doing my job right. That no man ever loved. The person that wrote this, can you tell that he loved the person he's writing to? Can't you just feel it? Can't you just know it? Can't you just sense it? I certainly can. And again, if you're going to go on up there and paraphrase this, you could, this is 14 lines. You could go on up there in just a short paragraph. Love is forever. It doesn't change, you know, when there's bad things happen, good things happen. Love is forever. And no matter how old you get, no matter what the heck is going to happen in your life, you know, that's, that's that's the way it is. If it's good, if it's permanent, if it's truly love, let man, not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. And again, as I'm trying to point out, the poetry forces you, and again, I've read this, oh God, I've read it a hundred times. And every time I read it, I you say, how did this guy write this? What is this, this profoundness in his, in his life? You know, where did he come up there? And that's the genius of Shakespeare. This was written 500 years ago. So what to tell you is that 500 years ago, people did indeed love. People did indeed care about their other, their other person, their wife, their loved one, they cared and it meant something to them. And Shakespeare puts this down in words in 14 lines. 
So uh, again, I think that's one of the definitions. Eh? Poetry forces you to think. It makes you ask questions. Is your life like this? Is your love life like this? I mean, are you married? I mean, do you and do you sense what he's saying? And if you and if you're just reading this, you know, again, like many of my high school students, I just read this and go, and well, and and well, maybe it'll take some time, son, for you to understand. But those of us who've been there, we already we understand. Right, Katie? And there she goes. <laughs> Now, let me try another one here. Emily Dickinson wrote 1,600 poems. She was a recluse. In many ways, she was a very sad, withdrawn young, she was a young girl when she finally, you know, passed away. She was only in her 30s. But some of her, her poems are so profound and they force you to think again. And a lot of them are depressing. A lot of them are depressing about death and about illness and, you know. Because I could not stop for death. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun, or rather, he passed us. The dews grew quivering and chill. For only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. We paused before a house that seemed the swelling of the ground. The road was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Tis since then, and it is centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. Ooh, great poem, no, great poem. And again, it is about death. But listen what she's saying, because I could not step for death, he kindly stopped for me. He goes on up there, she goes on and personifies death as a, as a carriage and someone driving this carriage that comes to get her. I think that's a unique way. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. And there's a good word, immortality. What's immortality mean? Ask yourself. It means that you live forever. There's something immortal about your soul. There's something immortal, at least that's what I, I believe. There's something immortal about ourselves, about who we are and what we what we are no matter what happens to us we slowly drove he knew no haste there we're not in a hurry we're, we're, we're in no hurry to get this done and i had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility she portrays mr death as someone who's very calm and civil and quiet as he comes and simply takes you away. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of glazing grain, gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. I've had the experience of being with several people who were who were terminally ill and who were facing the end. And one fella really, I found remarkable. He wanted to go for a ride. 
I said, certainly. Come on, we'll go for a ride. Where do you want to go? He wanted to go to all the places that he knew when he was a kid. He wanted to go to the playground. He wanted to go to the ball field. He wanted to go past the school that he went to elementary school when he was just a young boy. He wanted to go to the first house that he was in. Again, when he was just a young boy. And in each one of those places, we had to pause. You know, I pulled the car over and he was in the passenger seat next to me. And it was it was heartbreaking and it was very moving to me. How he just looked out the window. And one can only imagine what he was thinking. And I think it's easy to imagine what he was. He was thinking about what was the time when he was a little boy running, playing ball on those fields, when he was standing in line, waiting for the nuns to clap the bell to walk into Holy Family School, the house that he went into every day when he was a boy and saw his mother and father in his own own little bedroom where he had kept so many of his treasures. And now, and he knew very well what he was facing. But yet that was, and that was what he wanted to do, to make, and that's what she's doing, right? You know, creating, looking back these memories, these thoughts, these feelings, these experiences that we, that she had, that we've all going to have. Or rather, we passed the setting sun, or rather, he, the new, the dews grew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet, and my tool. Those are your old words. What it is is that she's in, she's in her coffin, and she just has a dressing gown on. That's why she gets this chill. She is dressed for her funeral. We pause before a house that seemed a swelling on the ground. That's her grave. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. That's the stone. That's the, that's the marker that, that remains. That's when my wife and I go out to the cemetery to visit our, our folks, and we do that. We believe in that. I remarked, I said, doesn't this look like a garden of stone? When you look out, there's all these monuments, all these monuments forever. Some, nobody's been there for years and years. And then there's others, there's a spray of flowers here and there and everything. But that's what's left, that's the marker. Since then to centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day, time becomes irrelevant. Isn't that what she's talking about? Time becomes irrelevant. I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. And again, we've got another very abstract word. Can you even imagine eternity? That's a rather hard one to imagine. Uh, But again, do you see this might be a sad poem, but it also causes you to reflect. That's what it's about, asking questions about she felt about her own life and about what meant something to her and about how she's looking over here at at her at her own end and how she personifies that this is carriage just coming to take her with the horses heads you can just imagine with the black plumes dressed up in a funeral cortege and they're taking her to her final resting place for eternity, but there's that word over here, immortality. And immortality, Emily Dickinson still lives on today. We study her, we listen to her, we we talk about her. Uh, let me. Uh, am I doing, Katie? You're doing great, Jim. I have oh, a comment, okay. um, if I may. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of our folks said, appreciating comments on love. We've been married 50, almost 51 years, not long enough. 
Wish I had had a teacher like you in high school. Oh, geez. Well, tell her, whoever that is, thank you, thank you. Because uh, I tried to, as a teacher, I tried to uh, make this make this meaningful. I wanted English class to be the one where everybody came to. They wanted to come. Let's go. Say, let's go to Banco's class. Make sure you don't miss that one. He's always got something to say. And well, Katie knows me. I always have something to say. And I went and I. I, I wrote on the board and somebody went up there and said, uh, what's this all about? And I, I went down life, birth, death, infinity. Really? I said, really? That's what this course is about. Life, birth, death, infinity. And we'd spend a lot of time talking because that's, that's really what this stuff is. It's all about living. It's all about dying. It's all about what the, the components that make our life up. And they, I used to wind up and make myself crazy because I'd go on up there. I used to do this five times a day and I'd, I'd be half did, but every time the class would take a different turn, somebody would have a question. Somebody would have a different approach. Somebody would go up and, you know, I mean, you know, somebody would tell me, Emily Dickinson, she's nuts. Well, okay. Define nuts. Why is she nuts? Why, why do you think she's, She's crazy, you know, uh, because she writes about death, because she's, she has these 1,600 poems. I mean, we could do a whole course. Maybe that's something. I could do a whole thing on Emily Dickinson, Katie. I mean, let me just try another one. And I think E.E. E. Cummings is one of the most underrated poets, and there's so many of them. William Carlos Williams, uh, you know, I mean, they're... They just have a way with language. This is Maggie and Millie and Molly and May. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day. And Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles. And Millie befriended a stranded star whose rays five languid fingers were. And Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raced sideways while blowing bubbles. And May came home with a smooth round stone as small as a world and as large as a loan. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. Wow. I think that is that is something. Now, if I'm teaching your class like you guys, you say, well, what do you think of that? What's he trying to tell you? I mean, it's silly. He had a way with words. You know, Maggie and Millie and Molly and May. I mean, he, he knew what he was doing with these words. He, could, he couldn't be Jack and Fred and Al. That wouldn't work. He knew how to make this a literature quality over Maggie and Millie. And he talks about all these things. But those last two lines are what sells it. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, is always ourselves we find in the sea. Think for a moment about yourself walking along a seashore all by yourself and just wondering and pondering. And that's what we do. You know, you got to spend some time thinking about your life and words and look at the vastness of the ocean. You know, I've been down to Florida and I stand down to Florida and I said, what happens if it drew a straight line from where I am at the St. Augustine? Just a straight line, a straight line. Well, you'd wind up in Africa. And I say, whoa, whoa, isn't that something? And then you look around and you see these seashells and everything. I mean, you know, and then the students would say, well, Mr. Banco, you must be nuts too. Yes, I am. You know, if that's the way, if that's what you want to think, but you, you have to go on to me. You look at some seashells. Well, there was a creature that used to live in that. And all of a sudden it's washed up on the soil. You look at the vastness of it. I mean, that's what, when I see an ocean, I am just, whoa. Look at, I mean, the vastness of the ocean. It always bothered me why they can't do something, why there should be any drought or people don't have water. Isn't there some way you can get the salt out of that water? Sure there is but it's all about money. It's all about money, you know, because man, there is a lot of, 
there's a lot of water out there. But again, this is what E.E. E. Cummings is forcing you to do. These other lines, he's just setting you up. Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles. Right? Yeah, you pick up some kid, picks up a little uh, shell, a sconch, they call them down in Florida. You listen, you can hear this. You know, all of a sudden, what was really, you got something else. You got a diversion. That's what it is. It's a diversion. Our walking on the beach and being alone, be it up there in the woods or uh, having a son and thinking about your own marriage and everything. He goes on up there and he says, for whatever it, it, for whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. That's something that I would throw out to uh, my students and say, well, what do you think, kiddos? What do you think? Huh? You ever been in despair? Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been down, depressed, you know, feeling insecure, feeling badly about things? Well, he's asking you to just take a look at what you can find, not just the sea, in life, the little things that means so she just finds a stone, a shell, right? A, a starfish and all of a sudden your life has changed right those things those burdens they don't exist anymore it's almost like somebody took a load off your off your back uh, Katie you got any questions or we're getting down uh -huh. to it we? yeah well, so we did have a comment, which I thought you may have seen, but it was, please comment on the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings. <laughs> well, there's E.E. E. Cummings right there. Mm -hmm. and, and we could do a whole thing because he was just, uh, he was just uh, re remarkable with his use of language. And sometimes you just don't even understand uh, what he's talking about. I mean, if I, I if I had a few, I should have maybe done a few more of his. But E. E. Cummings just loved to play, and they're short. But again, this thing's only. That's the other thing I love about poetry. You know, it's that this thing's twelve lines. It's twelve lines, and you could stand over here for a day, talking about what he's trying to get across and what he's trying to use with language and his words, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's just it's just amazing what great poet. I'm not a poet. I've tried fooling around and uh, everything, because there are different ways. You know, because one thing that Robert Frost said: the first thing, if you want to write a poem, is that you have to have rules. A poem, a great poem, has rules. His poem, "Stopping by the Woods," had a rhyme scheme, and the thing about the rules of a poem is that you make up the rules. <clears throat> when I was te teaching poetry <clears throat> in a class and we would try to write poetry, we would go on up there and says, you make up your own rules. You know, every third line has to rhyme. Okay, then that's your rule. Then every third line has to rhyme. Or you have to have a color in every second line. Or you've got to, you've got to talk about a person in the first and fourth and the, and the seventh line. And you're going to limit this thing to 10 lines. You just can't keep going on and on and on. I mean, because if you don't have rules, then the poem that we all know what doggerel is. Doggerel is junk. Doggerel is just a poem that, I mean, have you ever read a poem and you have no idea what they're talking about? Or what, uh, what is that? That, that's doggerel. You have to, any good poem, you walk away thinking, 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 and you've got a sense of understanding and you want to go back to it. Just like any good movie. How many times have you seen Gone with the Wind? I've seen Gone with the Wind 20 times if I've seen it once and I could watch it again. I mean, there are other books that I've read over and over you know, that I just, um, I just said, this is good. That's why I say to myself, I said, just listen, how many times, I love Shakespeare. I've read Macbeth so many times. And I said, look, at this is good. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? 
this is good. And so now we go on up there and we, uh, and if, and if you guys out there have any suggestions, I mean, you want to do a class on one specific poet like E.E. E. Cummings or, or uh, Emily Dickinson, or even Robert Frost, I'm more than, I mean, uh, you know, cause you're going to be the one who evaluates. You're the one who tells me if you want me back to do this again, or if you approve of what I've said or, or what i mean you can all tell me to go jump if you want you know i mean that's i don't know who you are i can't find you you know i won't be able to hunt you down but uh you know i just hope that you know that you got something out of this that we had some fun uh, this morning and maybe the different ideas and you can come on up with your own poem it's because i still go on back and i said now that we've read these poems can you see how this definition fits? Poetry is a metrical writing that formulates a concentrated uh, imaginative awareness of, of experience and language close, uh, language close and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhythm. Now, did any of the poems that we read this morning fit that definition? No, to me, it's, it's, it's bizarre. I like poetry is when emotions found a thought and the thought has found words. Now, the poems we read this morning, I think they fit. Anybody uh, want to holler at me or tell me to? <laughs> Katie, you can we, holler at me. I would never holler at you, Jim, but we have sure a comment you. that says, don't jump. I love your classes. <laughs> oh. Oh. Is she? Has she seen me before? I'm assuming she has. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, if anybody's got any, I even uh, put out uh, some of the people. I used to hand out my email to people because that doesn't bother me if it's junk or something. Because if you have any questions or you ever want to talk, I don't know. Uh, Here's Teresa. She would love to learn more about Robert Frost. Well, Katie, mm -hmm. you set something up because there's uh, poems we could, because he had a very strange, difficult life. I mean, this guy, he, he just didn't uh, pick up a paper and pencil and start writing poetry. You know, he had a lot of problems in his life. He had two of his children kill themselves, uh, you know, and so mental disorder was part of his family he had to commit his wife i mean he you know it wasn't uh it wasn't uh, an easy life so yes we if you know well katie's in charge here so you tell katie what you want and if you like me back uh we can you know i'm and i'm good and i can't wait till we get back to classes anybody that's seen me wouldn't you all of you people out there wouldn't you prefer me to be in front of you in a class yeah. like yeah yeah um, i mean I, I i had a good time when we were out at uh clarence and uh amherst and uh hamburg and orchard park i mean i, I really i really enjoyed uh, doing that and uh, i love the i love the feedback from you guys you've always been very generous to me and very kind and very very well and very opinionated you you told me what you like and what you don't like and what i you know i loved your class on the killer mockingbird there's my friend Teresa. well we could do the you know that's one of the great books and again i've read it a hundred times because every time there's a lesson it's all about teaching ourselves something that's why we read that's why you have to go on up and convince the students uh, that I'm in front, you know, and, you know, why are we reading this? Think about it. Think about it just for a minute about your own life, about, about what's going on. And that's what I tried to do. It just wasn't words to me. It was life living. And, and, uh, sometimes I, uh, I made a difference and sometimes kids, yeah, you're full of crap. And I, yeah, okay. All right. You know, I can't win them all, but I try. I, I try. 
So, um, so, so tell Katie, you guys, uh, tell Katie what you, uh, if there's any ideas, any thing. Mm -hmm. This is what, uh, yes, this young lady just asked me if I've always been so passionate about poetry. I've been passionate about good poetry, about good stuff. I want po poems that move me and touch me and cause me to think about about uh, my life. Like I said, coming from a family of eight kids, has anybody ever seen anything my brother wrote in the paper? My brother writes in my view, Steve, all the time. My brother is a uh, the most decorated uh, living Vietnam veteran in New York State. And uh, I've got another brother. All three of us have a degree in English. And we, we talk books. And, and I don't know where that came from. We used to, my mother used to read and and we said, uh, one of us, but somehow it became, we identify with what we read. I think that's another secret. We understand the loneliness, despair, and happiness, and love, and all of the, all of the things that make us human. You know, we, we understand those things. Right, Katie? Right, Jim. Right. <laughs> Another suggestion we had was, what about Maya An Angelou? Oh, absolutely. No problem. Maya Angelou, I did a, uh, I did a thing out at, uh, oh, Baptist, what's Manor. Baptist Manor on Black Poets. And I did Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, uh, and uh, some of the other, uh, you know, Black Poets that are out there. And Black Poetry is another, uh, Geraldine Brooks. So certainly, we, I can do anything that you, because I'm into this stuff, I can do anything that you guys would want me to do. I'm more than willing to spend the time preparing and doing whatever it is uh, that needs to be done. I just need your enthusiasm and your suggestions, and I'm... Uh, I'm on your side. I'm always amazed. I, I told Katie this many times when uh, they asked me to do this. My first question was, who's going to show up to this? Who wants to listen to me? And uh, I was told, don't you worry. And I didn't worry because as I, when I went to my first couple of classes out here, there, I had 30, 40 people, and I'm saying, wow. You really are interested in this stuff. And I said, yeah. And I, I got 85-year-old people asking me for homework. And I said, whoa, really? Okay. And uh, But uh, your enthusiasm is infectious. You know, the more enthusiastic you are, the more enthusiastic I am. And that makes, the, that makes for a good show. Definitely. Um, and with that, Jim, we just have one more question. And also your daughter said, hi, good job, Dad. I didn't want you to miss that. Um, oh, okay, Cheryl. We have, uh, we'll do the last question. Do you read the poems in the Sunday paper? I usually don't understand them. I feel they are abstract. Any thoughts? Yes, I consider those doggerel. I, I have no idea what they're talking about. I, I read the New Yorker magazine, and there are poems in there that I wonder. I said, who wrote this? Maybe they could explain to me what they wrote. Or and I don't think I'm a dumb guy. I, I got a few brain cells left and everything. That's what I mean. The poem, in order to work, has to be, it has to, you have to identify to it. You have to feel it. You have to understand it. It has to become part of your life. And some of the stuff, I agree with you, in the news, it's too personal. The person who wrote it might know what they're trying to say, but I sure don't. And like I said, there's magazines in New Yorker, which uh, they, they have a tendency to think that they're so sophisticated, you know, the, the New Yorker. You know, then I say, who, who, who's he talking to? Who, who, where is, I, I don't know. So I agree with you. And there are too many good poems. Stick with the stick with the people out there. If you don't do anything, go find Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver, my daughter knows her, and you're right, Cheryl. You know, Mary Oliver is, and she just passed away not too long ago. But the, I think she's the finest contemporary poet that we've got. 
there is a lot of good stuff. You don't have to read the stuff in the, the Buffalo News, but try Mary Oliver. Wonderful. Just to, and it gives you and it gives you pause. That's what good poetry does. It may whoa. Yeah, I never thought of things like that. Yeah, well now you do. Yeah, well, Jim, uh, last question. We've enjoyed your class, Jim. This is our fourth class. So um, with that, I think we'll end today's session. We've got great ideas. I took notes, Emily Dickinson, E.E. E. Cummings, Robert Frost, Jim, you and I'll talk on putting those together. And uh, yeah, keep the ideas coming. Jim, thank you for your time. Okay, thank all of you for your participation. <laughs> all wife, right, hi, wife. Jared. Yeah. Hello. Hello. All right. That's her, All right? right. <laughs> okay, Katie. Thank you. thank you, people. Thank you very much. All right. Everyone have a great day. Thank you again. Bye. Okay. Do I want to leave the event, Katie? Yep.